And this doctor, this in doctor, this lady who does not deserve to be a doctor, who does not deserve the title of being a doctor, this fucking bitch, she said, Hey guys, it's Aisha, and I'm back today with another video. I, I don't know what to call these sort of videos, like weird history or something like that. That's what I was going by. Important history? I don't know. I don't know. I'll figure it out later. But anyway, today I want to talk about the myths about black people in the medical world, basically. Because I've come across a few comments I saw on Facebook, and these aren't the only comments I saw. These were just some of the ones that really stuck out to me. I saw tons of comments like this throughout the years, and after seeing these comments, I figured, you know what? I'm going to make a video about this finally because it needs to be done. It needs to be talked about. It's ridiculous. So, that's what I'm doing here today. And of course, I'm going to put on my makeup, get ready for today. And we're going to talk about the myths about black people in the medical world. Or the myths about black people spread throughout the medical world. Something like that. You know what I'm trying to say. So let's get started. So we'll be trying out some new products today as well. And of course they will always be in the description box. I should probably put on primer before foundation, right? That's weird looking. So let's go back to 1820. To a doctor named Thomas Hamilton in Baldwin County, Georgia. And he was a medical physician, plantation owner. He was obsessed with proving that there were physical differences between black and white people other than our skin color, of course. It's very strange. So to do this, he chose to experiment on slaves, of course. Which is weird because in order to do an accurate experiment, you would need to experiment on a black person and a white person, not just a black person. So really what it seemed like he was doing was just torture. For most of his experiments, he used a man named John Brown, who was a slave. And according to Brown, Hamilton applied blisters to his body. He did it to his hands, his feet, his legs, his arms, all over his body. And according to Brown, he said he continued and he continued doing this until he drew up the dark skin from between the upper and under one. Which that was a little confusing to me. And he also said that he would do these experiments at an interval of about two weeks at a time until the experiments left him not able to work in the fields any longer. Thankfully, eventually Brown managed to escape. Yeah, it went on. It went on for about nine months and then eventually Brown managed to escape. I don't know why I keep trying new foundations and they always look weird. Anyway, eventually Brown managed to escape to England and after he escaped to England, he managed to write an autobiography about his experiences. The name of his biography is The Slave Life in Georgia, a narrative of the life, sufferings, and escape of John Brown, a fugitive slave now in England. But yeah, Hamilton seriously believed that the skin of black people was thicker than white people's, than the skin of a white person's, which is really strange and honestly it's sad because and I'm also mentioning this because this is something that's still believed in the medical world today too and also the fact that black people feel less pain than white people as well it was actually I actually heard an interview about it uh, I forget with who but it was on NPR and they were interviewing someone in the medical field about it and they said this is something that's still in medical records that black people feel less pain than white people and our skin is thicker and it's very strange like it makes no sense you would think that these people were smarter than that so anyway Hamilton did this because he was trying to determine how deep a black person's skin was 
Which I say again, it doesn't make any sense if you don't have a control group like another white person or something to compare it to. So yeah, that was his end goal as to why he was experimenting on John Brown and doing so many experiments for nine months. So yeah, like I mentioned, John Brown was a well-renowned and trusted physician. He was also a plantation owner and he was wealthy, of course. And he was a trustee of the Medical Academy of Georgia. And you know, like I say, he was trying to prove physical differences between black and white people. This is really like... Clearly this is one of the new products I'm talking about. I don't know how I feel about these. But he was trying to prove there are physical differences between black and white people. And trying to prove that black people were composed and function differently than white people and they seriously believe that black people have large sex organs and small skulls translated to promiscuity a lack of intelligence and a higher tolerance for pain so that's why he felt it was okay to do all these experiments on these people And also a higher tolerance for heat, apparently. They also believed that we had an immunity, black people had an immunity to certain diseases and more susceptible to others as well. Now all his theories, all of these were presented as fact. So yeah, these beliefs wormed their way into medical community and journals and they still reside there today. In a lot of medical journals and practices, these beliefs are still upheld today. Alright, let's get into this guy. Dr. Benjamin Mosley. In 1787, he wrote a manual, a trustee on tropical diseases and on the climate of the West Indies. And this guy believed that black people could bear medical operations with no anesthesia, nothing. He wrote that what would cause almost an insufferable pain to a white person was almost disregarded by a Negro. He also added that he has amputated the limbs of black people before while the black person held the limbs up for him. And they were just fine. So yeah, of course a lot of pro uh, slavery advocates took this information, this misinformation, and ran with it because it's exactly what they wanted to hear. They wanted, they wanted a way to torture black people with, while saying this doesn't hurt them at all. They can withstand it. That's pretty much what they were doing, and that's what they wanted. Even though logically it makes no goddamn sense. It makes no sense. I'm gonna do it. And of course, you guys know. Dr. J. Marion Sims, who is long regarded as a father of gynecology, who used black women as subjects in his experiments, without anesthesia, of course. Thankfully, his statue was recently torn down, I believe in April. So that's progress, somewhat. And of course, you got the ignorance going out saying, you're erasing history. Tearing down a statue is not erasing history. Erasing history would be taking out a books, taking it off the internet, taking the information away so no one can find it out, when all you have to do is read a book. A statue doesn't do that. A statue glorifies someone. In this case, someone who did not need to be glorified because he was torturing black people in the name of science. So between 1845 and 1849, he was practicing very painful, very, very painful experiments on black women without anesthesia in Montgomery, Alabama. Interesting, because I went, I visited Montgomery, Alabama, I visited the museums and stuff there. It's a very nice place. I would not want to live there. Has a terrible history, a lot of problems. Especially when it comes to the government there. But who am I to talk? So this was interesting that I read because if these people believed that black people couldn't feel pain but yet he spoke about in his autobiography about the agony the black women felt as he performed his procedures on them. 
it said the story of okay he wrote an autobiography called the story of my life and in it he described the agony the black women felt as he cut into their genitals in an attempt to perfect his surgical procedures so obviously they knew that they could feel pain and they did feel pain and continued on with it anyway so this isn't adding up so Dr. Samuel Cartwright was a physician and professor of disease of the Negro, Negro at the University of Louisiana now called Tulane University so anyway this guy Dr. Samuel Cartwright had a widely circulated paper it was called the report on the diseases and physical peculiarly peculiar it was called report on the diseases and physical peculiarities of the Negro race published in May 1851 in the New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journal in it he discussed physical differences between black and white people and he said that black people have a lower lung capacity Okay. He was just making stuff up left and right, like, oh my, like, what? He also proposed that black people suffered from a disease of the mind. Mind disease, apparently. And this was called drapedomania. And it caused them to run away from their slave owners. Because that's what caused them to run away from their slave owners, not the abuse. No, no, not the abuse they suffered, or the inhumane living conditions and working conditions, or just, or just because they were being held captive. No, it was because of this mind disease, of course, that they did not want to be held captive. That's why, according to Dr. Cartwright, because, you know, he's a doctor, so he must be right about that. That is insane. That is insane. That is insane. Oh my god. He said that slaves contracted this disease um, when their owners treated them as equals. And his recommendation as a preventative measure, measure was for the slave owners to whip the devil out of these slaves um, to prevent them from running away. That, that's what Dr. Cartwright said. Like, it must have been super easy to become a doctor back then. Like, for real. It's, it's crazy. But, I mean, I guess if you're telling the people what they want to hear, it doesn't matter. Because I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that's what all the white slave owners wanted to hear, of course. Pow. Okay, so still, even today, after 150 years of post-slavery after more than 150 years of post-slavery the lies of black immunity and immunity to pain and weakened lung function it still shows up in medical journals today and education and philosophy because why why so let's go back to Dr. J. Merriam Sims, the guy I told you about as being the father of gynecology and how his statue was torn down in New York in April. Yay. So back in 1808, there was a federal ban on slaves being imported from other countries. And white physicians and slave owners portrayed themselves as helping slaves. But really, they just were reaping all the benefits. I mean, slaves were like cattle to them, basically. Really. Yeah, they did experiments on slaves without consent, of course, because they were only seen as property. There was no consent needed, in their opinion. So Sims actually performed over, over 30 surgeries on one single woman. Her name was Anarcha, and this resulted in the successful treatment of VVF, which was some 
like his main thing was trying to develop a treatment for VVF. And he was able to do that by experimenting on Anarcha. And he was the president of the Med American Medical Association. Now, of course, slave owners were happy about this new development because that meant that their slaves could return to work. Um, they could heal properly, return to work, and they would maintain their economic value. A survey done in 2016 found that about 50% of white medical students and residents endorsed the false beliefs about biological differences between black and white people. That's who you have as doctors, people. That's, that's who we have. And about 25% of medical residents believe that black people literally have thicker skin than white people. Not figuratively, not figuratively speaking, literally. We apparently have thicker skin than white people. That is what they believe. And they uphold, up the, they uphold this to be true. Even though it makes no damn sense, but okay. Yeah, that is who we have treating us in the medical field today. And of course, participants who endorse more false beliefs about the biological differences between blacks and whites showed a racial bias in the accuracy in the accuracy of their treatment recommendations, especially in gy gynecology which is detrimental to the mother and the baby as well. And in some cases, as we've seen more and more, as of lately, it has been deadly to both, has been fatal. Black women are three to, three to four times as likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. So as a lot of us know, cardiovascular disease and high blood pressure are two of the leading causes of maternal death. And hypertensive disorders have been on the rise for the last two decades, including 72% from 1993 to 2014. And of course, preeclampsia and eclampsia are 60% more common in African American women and more severe. In 1850, the infant mortality rate was 350 infants per 1,000 while the white infant mortality rate was 217 per 1,000. And this was only found out once the U.S. started recording this, so before that, we have no idea. And W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about this in his 1899 book, The Philadelphia Negro. In 1960, the U.S. was ranked as a 12th among developed countries in infant mortality. So that should tell you something. That's bizarre. Like there's no reason why that should be the case. Today it's 32nd out of 35 largely due to the amount of deaths of black babies. Black babies are now twice as likely to die as white infants. 11.3 per 1,000 for black infants um, to 4.9 per 1,000 for white babies. The U.S. is now one of 13 countries in the world where the maternal mortality, the death of a woman related to a pregnancy or childbirth, is now worse than it was 25 years ago. Each year, about 700 to 900 maternal deaths occur in the U.S. and 500,000 preventable near-death experiences occur in the U.S. That's a 200% increase from 1993 to 2014. And that was the last year, 2014 was the last year that the statistics were available for this. So we have no idea at this point. Yeah, racial biases in the healthcare field can, including dismissal of legitimate concerns and symptoms can explain some of the poor birth outcomes. So yeah, this is, this was heavy. This was a very, I mean, it's all heavy. It's all, it's all a lot. Now, I actually want to share my own experience with this subject because this has happened to me. Let's take it back almost nine years ago. So, obviously, I was pregnant, uh, and yeah, and throughout my entire pregnancy, 
I had issues. This is my first pregnancy, my only pregnancy. And yeah, this doctor I chose, she came highly recommended by someone I actually trusted and was very close to. So I trusted their recommendation. Um, I asked a bunch of people about different doctors and stuff. I did my own research. But when it came down to it, I figured a uh, personal rec recommendation was better than anything else. Because when I do anything, when I buy anything, I always read reviews first and I go based off of that. So this was kind of like that. This was kind of like a review for a doctor. So anyway, this lady came highly recommended. Um, and actually my mother-in-law is a nurse practitioner. They both work in the same hospital. She did tell me that she didn't really know this doctor personally. And she knows she... She knows a lot of doctors, obviously, because she works very closely with them. So she did tell me that she didn't know this doctor personally very well, but she said she heard a lot of great things about her. So she figured I was in great hands. Everything would be fine. Because obviously she was invested in this as well, because this was going to be her grandchild. Anyway, but yeah, my husband and I, we were engaged at the time. We weren't married yet. Which you would think it, it should matter, but it does. It comes into the it comes into the uh, comes into play in the story. So anyway, throughout my pregnancy, it was very hard. It was very hard, um, which I knew it wasn't gonna be easy, cause I just had a feeling it wasn't gonna be easy because I'm smaller for my size and my age. I've always been underweight, kind of I've always been smaller had a smaller frame so yeah I knew it was gonna be kinda difficult so I knew I needed a doctor that was gonna be there for me that was gonna be a good doctor you would think so I knew I needed somebody who like knew what the hell they were doing and this lady came highly recommended I think she had like 25 plus years in the field as a doctor as an OBGYN so yeah I chose her um, she was not black. Anyway, I knew there was going to be issues throughout my pregnancy. I had morning sickness for like seven, eight months. I was actually put on medicine, um, just so I could keep some food down. And it was actually medicine that they give to chemotherapy patients to help them keep food down. That's what they ended up giving me. Before they gave me that, I lost about five to ten pounds. So sometime during that first trimester, I lost like 5 to 10 pounds when I should have been gaining weight. That's where this doctor comes into place because throughout all this, I'm telling her like, hey, I can't keep anything down. It, it took her a while to actually give me the medicine. I kept telling her this, like, hey, can't keep anything out. It was until she actually saw that I lost 5 pounds when they weighed me again. She was like, oh yeah, we need to get you on some medicine. I'm like, I've been telling you this. Cause she kept telling me oh it's gonna stop soon it's gonna stop soon I'm like it doesn't seem like it's gonna stop so finally after you saw, after she saw I lost five pounds I was like oh yeah let me put you on some medicine so you can keep some food down and it took her a while to do that because she I guess didn't believe me when she could have easily just if she didn't believe me just weighed me I'm like why would I lie about that and then at the time I also had this terrible job that I hated where I was working as a baker with this company as a scratch made baker and stuff at this company where you have to lift like 50 pound bags and stuff and I was telling them, like I can't lift that much right now I'm pregnant like I can't lift. even if I wasn't pregnant I can't lift that like for real really really I can't so my employer at the time they were trash and they were like, oh yeah, well, we're going to need a doctor's note. I was like, okay, then I'll get a doctor's note. So I went to the doctor. Went to this lady. And then she presented, then proceeded to tell me um, that it's not a disability, blah, 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 all that crap. And I took, then proceeded to tell like, even before pregnancy, I couldn't lift 50 pounds. So why do you think I can now that I'm pregnant? That makes no sense. And then she also told me something about how are you ex going to um, explain how do you expect to hold a uh, carry a five-year-old while you're pregnant women do that all the time like I'm not planning on doing that why would I plan on carrying a five-year-old while I'm pregnant anyway it was just so many issues with this lady and throughout it I like I think at month six 
I got tired of her not listening to me. Um, just being complete trash, basically. Like, she just was not... She wasn't mean, but it was obvious that she wasn't taking my concerns seriously. Uh, I would tell her... I would try to tell her some of my concerns, and she would just, like, blow them off. It wasn't until my, mother, my stepmother... Sorry. My mother-in-law stepped in and came to one of my, my appointments with me and said, Hey, she has questions she needs to ask you. And she told me to write down my questions, and I wrote them down. She came with me, and... I asked all the questions I needed and that it wasn't until then that she actually listened but even before that it was just I wanted to switch doctors even after that I still wanted to switch doctors like month six I was six months pregnant I was ready to switch a doctor I wanted a new doctor but somebody convinced me somebody else I was close to convinced me to no just stick with it it's almost over you only have three months to go blah blah and I was like I don't want this lady to deliver my baby and I also didn't feel like she was even gonna be there to deliver my baby in the end honestly but yeah there were so many other issues like and it all came down to just her not listening to me which could have solved everything would have resolved everything which would have prevented prevented everything from happening that did happen so anyway let's cut to what was that 39 weeks I believe 37 weeks. I was at 37 weeks. So, before all that, throughout this entire process, month month after month after month, I noticed like something was wrong, um, especially coming into the seven, the six month mark. Again, like my entire body was swollen. Like my head was hurting all the time. It was ridiculous. It just... It seriously felt like my head was going to fall off or something. Like, it hurt so much. And, honestly, even my head was swollen. My head from my from my head to my feet were swollen. Now, a normal person would say, Hey, there's something wrong. And normal people did say that. At work, wherever I went, people were like, Hey, you're swollen. There's something wrong. And I was like, yeah. And they were like, hey, you need to go to the doctor. I'm like... I did. They keep sending me home. That was the thing too. They kept sending me home and telling me nothing was wrong when I was visibly fr uh, swollen from my head to my feet. And it just like got worse and worse as the months went on. Starting at like, I want to say it started at six months. That's when it started to get very noticeable. Yeah, six months. That's when it started getting very noticeable. So anyway, and throughout this, I'm, I'm still going to work, by the way, because I had to work, I guess, and my doctor wasn't listening to me when I was telling her there were issues. So throughout this, I'm going to work, visibly swollen. Um, I was not lifting bags or anything like that. Like, Thankfully, my coworkers were decent people, and they like actually helped me because my doctor was not helping me. Nor my manager. My managers were trash. The whole company was trash, honestly. But, yeah. So, let's cut to 37 weeks. That is the minimum amount of time it takes for a baby to be fully developed or ready to be delivered. So, in that, I was exactly at 37 weeks when Aerie was delivered. So, anyway, 37 weeks um, at home. And for, like, the for like the entire week I was told like I kept feeling like I had contractions which I was so I was like trying to lay on the floor and stuff I felt like I was going to the doctor like every day telling them something's wrong this is happening and they kept sending me home kept sending me home and I told this woman at work what was going on she was a nurse as well she worked there we actually worked at a retirement home a retirement center and she was a nurse there and I was telling her what was going on because like every day my coworkers would check in on me like hey how you doing what's going on blah 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 and I was telling her what's going on, um, and I kept telling her, I was like, she was like, you need to go to the doctor, you need to go to the doctor. And I was like, I am going to the doctor, he keeps sending me home. And she was like, no, keep going, keep going, keep going. And, she, and then she told me what happened with her son. And she said her son was having issues, he kept going to the doctor, and they kept sending him home. And she said that eventually she had to go and yell at some people to finally get some tests done. And it turns out her son had breast cancer, and they kept sending him home, telling him there was nothing wrong with him the whole time he had breast cancer. So he had to have a double mastectomy because of that, and these people kept sending him home. So after she said that, I just kept going, kept going, kept going. And then eventually, I just got tired. I got tired. 
I was very big, very swollen, and my head hurt all the time. And I was still up and walking around and working and doing all that stuff. And I just was in pain all the time. And it just sucked. So I got tired. And I was like, I don't want to. I just want to sleep. So the day I actually went into labor, um, it was like super early in the morning. And I just was in pain. And I just got up. And I just, I couldn't sleep that night. So I got up. I was in pain. I was having contractions. My head, like my head felt like I could barely lift it. It felt so heavy. So I got up and I just laid on the floor and then my husband, fiance at the time, woke up and he was like, what's going on? I was like, I just don't feel well. I'm laying on the floor. He was like, no, get up. We're going to the hospital. So he took me to the hospital. And while we're at the hospital, guess who wasn't there? My doctor. Because of course I knew she wasn't going to be there. I knew she wasn't going to be available. And that's another reason why I wanted to switch doctors because I wanted someone who's actually going to be available and be there for me. And she was not in any sort of the way throughout my pregnancy during delivery she was not there who actually delivered my baby was a black resident and I remember her name she was a great lady I felt so bad because when she was delivering I was just over it I was over everybody at the hospital I was so pissed and just so irritated and so done with that hospital and those doctors and the nurses there I was just so done with them and I felt bad because I kind of got an attitude with her and she didn't deserve it she did a great job she like delivered the baby by herself. The baby came out in minutes, honestly, because my mother-in-law believes I was in labor the entire week. The entire week they were sending me home, she believes I was in labor. And that's why the baby came out so fast and so easily. So yeah, she was a great doctor. And um, I think she actually got reassigned, like her hospital, like she got a job at a hospital in Atlanta, so she moved. But yeah, she was a great doctor, and I'm glad that my mother-in-law actually like sent her a thank you basket and card on my behalf because she did a great job, even though she was only a resident and she was still like training. And her trainer, doctor, whoever, I don't know, he didn't show up till after the fact, like after the baby was out and she was about to cut the umbilical cord. But yeah, so she did that all on her own, and she was amazing. Good for her. She did amazing. But um, yeah. But she was the one, the resident was the one that actually told me, she came up to me and she was like, hey, did you know that your protein levels are 11 times the normal levels? I was like, no, I didn't know that. No one told me that. I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, she actually phrased it in a way like, hey, we had to put you on magnesium because of your protein levels. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then she told me all that. And I was like, no, no one told me that. I don't think anybody ever even checked, honestly. But yeah, she checked, found it out. My protein levels were extremely high, and I was on the verge of having a stroke. Um, thankfully, I didn't. Uh, they put me on a bunch of magnesium. I think I was in a hospital for like two days or something. The baby was fine. She was only about five pounds, but she was fine. Um, they put me on magnesium, which made me like super dizzy. And yeah, after that, I was like in and out of consciousness of sleeping on and off I was exhausted my head started to feel better which was nice the swelling started to go down and then also while I was recovering in my recovery room in the bed and my family was in and out and stuff they were taking a baby in and out to get bathed and whatnot so I was in there by myself sometimes so while I'm in there by myself at one point in comes this trainer doctor whoever this head doctor whoever the hell he was who was over the resident he came in with like three other guys who I'm assuming were residents as well because he was like talking to them teaching them three white guys and the trainer head guy was also a white guy they all come in he like rips the sheets off of my legs and stuff and is like poking my feet with a pen he didn't say anything to me or anything like that he just started poking my feet and stuff and I think he like lifts my shirt it was like examining me with these three guys and nothing was said he didn't like introduce himself or anything like that because he didn't even tell me his name it was just i was just like i was so over that place oh my god another instance when i was like in and out dozing i woke up and my family was out again i think they went and got me some food or something because i didn't really want the hospital stuff and i really really wasn't very hungry but they went and tried to give me some food but i woke up from one of my naps and there's my doctor who just magically appeared out of nowhere after everything had, was already done and she was like sitting in a chair 
next to my bed and she had like her hands and her head her head in her hands like this and she was like I'm so sorry I'm so sorry it's like what are you talking about and she was like I'm so sorry and she was like um I was like it's fine it's already done and she was like no I just had so many patients I had too many patients I should have been paying better attention but I wasn't because I had too many patients so I'm so sorry and that is what I told my fiance at the time that is exactly what I told him at the time. I was like, I want to switch doctors because I feel like she's not listening to me. She has too many patients. Like, she would honestly come in the room with me while I was pregnant and, like, spend only a few minutes with me and then leave. And I'm like, I don't feel like this is right. Like, this isn't how it's supposed to go. I feel like she's supposed to be giving me more attention, pay, taking better care of me than what she was. And she wasn't. Like, she didn't care. So, yeah. And I was like, I was right. I was right. I knew it. And also it just seemed like she didn't give a damn. And she was just more concerned about money. She didn't give a damn about me. But yeah, she was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So I was like, okay, whatever. Anyway, I started dozing off again. And then um, she said something about she was going to catch up with my mother-in-law. She knew my mother-in-law was a nurse. And she was going to catch up with her and let her know what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, okay, because I was in and out. Like I said, I was still on magnesium. They were trying to get me to not have a stroke. So, Yeah. I was just done with that lady. I didn't want to see her anymore. I was over her. So anyway, and this is the funny part too. After all this happened, the hospital decided to pay for all my treatment in my hospital bed and everything. Everything would be free, was free because I was a high risk pregnancy. And I'm like, that's not why they did it. They did it because they didn't want me to sue. I'm like I still should I still should have sued honestly I really wish I really wanted to I wanted to but suing people cost money and time that I did not have so after all that was said and done and my family came back and got me food and stuff and my doctor did catch up with my mother-in-law you know what my mother she told my mother-in-law and my mother-in-law didn't tell me this until after we were out of the hospital I think a couple of weeks later she told me but she said they were in the hallway talking and my mother-in-law asked her, she was like, okay, what are her chances of this happening again with her next pregnancy? And this doctor, this in doctor, this lady who does not deserve to be a doctor, who does not deserve the title of being a doctor, this fucking bitch, she said to my mother-in-law, she said, oh, you never know what these girls and their different babies' daddies. Like, what girls, what different babies' daddies? This was my first pregnancy, my only pregnancy that I had with my fiance who is now my husband so what the hell was she talking about and it was obviously some racial bias so when she said that to my mother-in-law my mother-in-law said she flipped out a little bit and was like excuse me what the hell are you saying and then the doctor tried to backtrack and say oh you never know because blah 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 but yeah I really wish I would have sued her after my mother-in-law told me that though I did go on to the, I think it was the hospital website, and I left a review about this doctor under there, and I detailed every little thing that happened, even the comment that she made to my mother-in-law, because I wanted people to know exactly what happened, who she was, and what she was like, because every other comment she got um, seemed to be a de decent comment, like she got pretty good reviews, and then they got my, my review my actual review and it seemed like every all her other because I think they have pictures on there too so I think it like all her other patients were white as well but I left my comment my review and I think it's still up um I know my mother-in-law told me like two years ago that it was still up so I think it's still up to this day I hope it is because I don't think I should say it on the camera where her name is but she's still working at the hospital in Savannah and she's trash and I think yeah she's still there just do your research. Um, if you feel like something's off, it probably is. And do what's best for you. Um, don't let anybody talk you out of it like they talked me out of it because I wish I would have sued her ass. And also, I just wish I would have found another doctor even though, even though I was at six months um, during my pregnancy. But that is it. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And please tell me about your experiences that you have or if you know of any good doctors in the world <laughs> I don't know it's just a lot thank you for watching I'll see you guys next time bye